The following edition of Connecticut Valley Views is made possible by Windsor Federal Savings, with offices in Windsor, Bloomfield, Granby, and East Windsor. Neighbors helping neighbors since 1936. Join me, Susan Regan, host of Connecticut Valley Views, the most widely watched interview program on Connecticut Public Access TV. Proof to the people is the byline, insight without bias, generating a 360 perspective. Our mission is to focus on topical subjects with thought-provoking interviews regarding municipal leadership, current affairs, educational and political topics, as well as key destination points in New England. And thank you for joining me today. My guest is Mark Janis. He is international law scholar and professor at UConn School of Law in Hartford. Thank you very much for being thank here Thank you, today, Susan. Mark. Nice to meet you. Okay. It's a pleasure. Now, you've been teaching law for over 30 years, and your background is very substantial. Uh, you've been t teaching here since 1980. Give us a little bit more information and background on that. Well, I came to um, law teaching from law practice. And before that, I came from the Midwest, from Illinois and Michigan. And uh, I always knew I was interested in things international. And uh, when I was looking at universities back then, looked at Princeton because I had a strong program at the Woodrow Wilson School. And I wasn't disappointed. It was a great place. And my interest has always been more in international relations than in law. And so as an undergraduate, I sort of narrowed my career choices to diplomacy, which I think I would have enjoyed. Uh, international journalism, which I would have enjoyed as well, or um, international law, mm -hmm. and I chose international law. Um, and so even as an undergraduate, I took a course in international law. And then I was lucky enough to get a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford. I could do my first law degree there and take some more international law. Then uh, I went into the Navy in the 1970s, served four years uh, there, um, and from there went to Harvard Law School more law and more international law. So I was doing a lot of international law even when I was as young as 18 or 19, so I was very lucky. And I had a great string of professors and a great string of experiences there in my uh, young adulthood. And then uh, after Harvard, I chose to practice with a big international firm, Sullivan & Cromwell, which has been along uh, the road of international law really from its beginnings. Uh, one of its founders, William Nelson Cromwell, represented the French bondholders who sold the mm -hmm. Panama Canal to mm -hmm. the United States. And then um, in the 1930s, its managing partner um, became the Secretary of the United uh, States in the Eisenhower administration, John Foster Dulles, and his brother, Alan Dulles, who was the uh, head of the firm's Berlin office, became director mm -hmm. of OSS, the predecessor to the CIA, where he later served. And although I wasn't at Sullivan and Cromwell when um, John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles were there. I did work with the people who had worked with him, yes. so I was working with people. Yes. And even while I was there, there were quite a number of people like John Stevenson and Arthur Dean who had served the mm -hmm. U.S. government as international lawyers. So SNC was a great place to learn international law. And they'd had a Paris office since the 19th century, and I got the chance to work there. And um, I made the decision while I was in Paris to go into teaching partly because I wanted to um, do my own research and writing, but also just partly to sort of be with my family because there was so much traveling involved in, in the kind of work people do at and Sullivan and Cromwell. And teaching kind of keeps you grounded. And, and well, you teaching let me plan my schedule. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was a practicing lawyer, Susan, really three out of four, nine out of ten commitments I'd make to, you know, go to the theater, do something with kids, mm -hmm. I had to cancel because mm -hmm. the clients came first. So you can never really plan your life. Sure. And... Um, I, I know you've worked in the corporate world, so you know yes. that the lawyer's worst enemies are <laughs> their clients. Corporate yes. clients are very yeah. demanding, yeah. and you really have to respond to them. Mm -hmm. And the family does take a second place mm -hmm. to the corporate client. And so that really didn't suit me. We have mm -hmm. four boys, and I wanted them to grow up. So that was probably the principal reason I switched over from mm -hmm. private practice to teaching, so that I could keep control of my life. Which Not that I don't important. respect the corporations. They're fine. Yeah. But they're but they're real taskmasters. Yes. Um, and so that suited me very well. Mm -hmm. I, I've enjoyed teaching a lot. I've certainly missed the, the intellectual stimulation and the challenge of private practice, but you can't have everything. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly the financial rewards of private practice can, are much can greater. You, can you ever moonlight, may I say? Would anybody ever bring you in to, say, a particular case? Because I, I have from time to time, but it, you know, I become less and less valuable as I get more and more apart from practice. I, I mean, see. 
when I moved into teaching in 1980, I probably knew something about, mm -hmm. I did international financial law, and I would have known something about international financial law then. But now it's been, I'm, I'm not counting very well, almost 35 years, and uh, international finance has changed so much that I would not be a useful Is this similar lawyer. to a doctor who needs to keep up with all the latest in whatever particular field? There's so many specialists where you need to constantly be refreshing and reviewing and so forth to... That is, that is entirely right. I mean, mm -hmm. a lawyer like a doctor you go to not because you want to, but because you need to. Mm -hmm. And um, you want them to have the specialized knowledge that they get. So, you know, if you're going to a physician or a lawyer, you don't want this to be a new situation for them. You want this to be something that they've seen over and over again. Mm -hmm. And a law professor just isn't like that. I yes. mean, we, we benefit from having been in practice, but we're no longer, we're no longer really practitioners. You get, I'm sure, a great deal of satisfaction out of the students. There are obviously some students who stand out to you that look as though they're going to make it? Well, the students are really the best part of the job. Um, you know, my wife has been a high school teacher, and I think she has a much more difficult job mm -hmm. for that. I deal with students who are generally between the ages of about 22 and 30, and it's a very good group to work with. They're all in law school because they want to be there. They're young adults already. They're mature. They want to learn. Mm -hmm. They're responsible. Uh, but unlike older people, unlike you know Bill, mm. you and I, they're mm. much more optimistic about life, mm. and uh, they're a good, upbeat, good group to work with. And sure. so it's nice to be working with the twenty somethings. And so I've always enjoyed that. Yes. And as far as good students go, yes, I mean I've had some excellent students who've gone to on to great careers, um, and uh, you know that's always a satisfaction. Mm. Do they, when you're teaching international law, does, does that mean that they are segregated to that one piece? Or oh, you're no, teaching no, no, no. Law school, law school is a general degree. Okay. Everyone passes the bar examination, so you have uh, a little bit of a lot of things. Uh, you can take more or less of corporate law or tax law or family law or criminal law or international law if you want. And, and students, many of them do tend to, there's no actual major or minor, like an undergraduate study, but some do tend to take more of one sort of course if they know that yes. they want to do that. Yeah. All right, let's, let's get to the heart of the matter, Mark. You are interested in international law. That obviously states that international law, there is a difference between what we have for constitutional law in the United States and other countries. What would be, say, the greatest difference between our constitutional law and international law and what you teach. Well, let me come at it a little bit from the side, sure. but then we can come back to your specific country comment. Um, the most important thing to realize, and I'm sure you realize, realize this in your, your, your own work, is that no, no country is like any other country. And so what we do for law or what we do for politics or what we do for economy or religion is not like any other mm. country. And my own background is Midwestern, and I know very well that we're not exactly like New England, mm -hmm. and New England's just not exactly like the South, and the South not exactly like the Certainly. West. So even within a country, there's a great deal of variation. Certainly. And when you start moving from country to country, there's great changes. And I think the most important thing for an international lawyer to learn at the early stage of, of her or his career is just to be tolerant and to accept those differences, not to assume that because different places do it in an un-American way, mm -hmm. it's necessarily wrong. And vice versa, I think it's really important for other countries not to prejudge America. Just because we do things differently than you might do in another country, not to prejudge us wrong. So that tolerance, I think, is important. And I think most people who practice international law have that sort of tolerance. Because mm -hmm. if you don't, you really can't work with people. You've got to accept them as they are. You were telling me that you're part Australian. Mm -hmm. If you're working with the Australians, you've got to accept that. Mm -hmm. Objectively, you may say, well, there's things about Australia I like. There's things about Australia I don't like. Fair enough. Mm. But you've got to accept the Australian as an Australian. Mm -hmm. And vice versa, the Australian shouldn't judge us. There may be ways in which they prefer Australia to America or America to Australia, but they shouldn't just rule us out because we're different. And so um, that tolerance of law, economics, religion, politics, society, that is really the, the uh, crucial thing to well, do. So we don't, we don't do things the way other countries do, but frankly, Nobody does it the way others do. Belgium doesn't do it the way the Netherlands does. France doesn't do it the way Italy does. That variation I is the way the world is. Well, let me ask you this then. Um, if in fact, I mean, we're one of the youngest countries in the world. Not really. It, well, if we were to say, though, when the founding fathers came over here and started to set 
the precedent. They for didn't. They've been here five or six generations. Okay. Or but more. But were they not taking all of the experiences of what things had happened in other countries? Nope. And saying that's what we not don't nope. want to do anymore. No, nope. absolutely then, not. Then nope. how did they come? Well, to... I'm older than you, so I can remember. Okay. <laughs> but you know, most of the founding fathers came from families that had been here for many generations. Mm -hmm. uh, they were not um, revolutionaries. They mm -hmm. were conservatives, mm -hmm. and um, they were used to a form of government, which was very English, uh, with a governor who was appointed by the crown. Mm -hmm. Uh, an assembly which was elected by mm -hmm. the people, although maybe not mm -hmm. as broad a franchise as we have now, but it varied. Mm -hmm. A senate which came from the uh, more notable people of the state or colony. And then a judiciary which normally was, you know, uh, appointed by the governor. And mm -hmm. So our tripartite system of government that you see in the yes, Constitution right. was perfectly ordinary. Connecticut prides itself on having one of the world's oldest constitutions. We had a constitution, a written constitution in the 1650s. Mm -hmm. You ever heard of the Charter Oak? Yes. Well, what happened was, I think it was James II, maybe it was <coughs> Charles mm -hmm. II, tried to take that charter away so they could reestablish a mm -hmm. new form of government in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And the good citizens of Connecticut took that charter and hid it in the Charter Oak and preserved yes, their the liberties. Tree. The tree. So do some arithmetic for me. Take 1650 mm -hmm. and take 1789 and tell me how many years were in between. 1650 and 1789, 139. That's right. So if you were looking at the U.S. Constitution and you live, where do you live now? What town? Granby, Connecticut. Granby. If you were living in Granby, how much longer would have you had your Constitution than the Americans? <coughs> 139, 139 years. 139 years. Yeah. All right. Now, to you and me, that's not a long time because we're older than that, right? Mm -hmm. We're okay with that. Mm -hmm. But 139 is real time. So Connecticut prides itself on having a Constitution that not, old, is not only much older than the American mm -hmm. Constitution, but is much older than virtually every other constitution in the world, which means the people you t refer to as our founding fathers mm -hmm. um, were doing just what they were used to. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the Connecticut Charter, you look at the other uh, constitutions that the other states had, New York, Virginia, mm -hmm. what have you, they're not dissimilar from what existed before. These were replicas of the British Constitution as it existed in the 17th and 18th century. Except what, what, what I see is the greatest difference. If I were to challenge you on that, I would say that they were not interested in a regime. They were interested in more of what we would refer to, the common layman referred to as democracy. Who? As, as a more open and freer choice for people. Where I don't think so. I think, I think the Founding Fathers were more interested in preserving what they were in fear of losing which was control of their affairs to the government in Westminster. And here's a similarity that you can mm. see between American government and, and colonial government, imperial government in those days. You had a necessary tension, Susan, between the government at Westminster in England mm -hmm. and the government in places like Hartford and Albany mm -hmm. and Boston, back and forth. Now, that's not dissimilar from the tension we have between the government in Washington Mm -hmm. and the government in the states. Certainly, certainly. So it should be no surprise that the way we structured American federalism within the Constitution mm -hmm. was similar to the experience of the Founding Fathers. They, yes, they, they, they did study the Netherlands, they did study Switzerland, both of which had constitutions that were similar to the British one and mm -hmm. interesting for mm -hmm. the Americans. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, they were trying to preserve <coughs> what they saw as self-government. These people were people who had already served as um, members of the assembly, served mm -hmm. as judges, served as elected representatives within the <coughs> British Constitution. So you can tell me a little bit about uh, Australia now. When did Australia become independent? Oh, actually, I don't even think that it is specifically. I, I don't know what the word independent means. Exactly because it's right. still Because it is still answers to the queen. But it's still, it still has had for decades, probably mm -hmm. more than 100 years, some powers that are democratically governed, as it mm -hmm. were. And, and, and this was true in the 13 British colonies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how long Britain could have carried on ruling over the 13 colonies if they hadn't made certain governmental mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't inevitable mm -hmm. that the Americans would uh, revolt. <coughs> and it was, it was unsurprising that the form of government we established in 1787, <coughs> 70, or if you want to go back mm -hmm. to 1776, was very much comparable to what England had and what they thought they 
mm -hmm. they were going to. So these were, these were old models for us, and they were encapsulated in, in two important authors that everybody read in those days. One, one was uh, John Locke, mm -hmm. who justified the revolution of 1688-89, explaining the division of powers between the crown, the parliament, and the judiciary, and then Montesquieu in, I think it was 1746, mm -hmm. who talked about the separation of powers. But both what both Locke and Montesquieu were not prescribing as much as describing. Mm -hmm. Both Locke and Montesquieu were trying to describe the way in which British government mm -hmm. worked, because people noticed that the British had more freedoms, was more democratic than the European countries. Montesquieu especially, um, he... Um, you know, when he came to England, he was wondering, you know, France was the richest country, it was the most civilized country, it has the highest standard of living, everything like that, but Britain had more freedoms, and he was wondering why that was. And he wrote this book called The Spirit of the Law, L'Esprit des Lois, and his conclusion was because it was a separation of powers. Mm -hmm. So he made that explicit, and, and the American revolutionaries grew up on Locke, they grew up in Montesquieu, and they grew up in people much less well-known mm -hmm. who were describing to them the way the British government worked. Mm -hmm. And so we were trying to make a not only the old form of British government, but a form of British government that would work for us. And it, it's no surprise, that's what they knew. Well, when you say it's going to work for us, you, you did say, though, the greatest differentiation was, if I understood you correctly, was that here they wanted more of the people to have a say and a smaller government. Would that be the greatest discrepancy it between it the differed. two? It differed. I mean, Americans, as you know, you know, Americans really have differed over time. You know, if you go back to the the, the founding fathers, yes. Jefferson, yes. Madison, you had the Federalists who were much more oriented towards larger government, right. Hamilton's a good example, mm -hmm. and the Democratic Republicans who were much more oriented to smaller government. So we've always had a pendulum that swung between politicians and people who believe a larger government is better and a smaller government is better. So we've never been settled in that. And if you look at the debates you know, that animated mm -hmm. the, the earliest presidential elections or elections for Congress or state Congresses and such in the 1790s, that was an issue. Mm -hmm. People would debate it the same way they did now. Um, you know, as Gilbert and Sullivan said, some people are born uh, little liberals and some are born little conservatives. Some people are born little government people and some mm -hmm. people are born little mm -hmm. anti-government people. And I don't think that, even though the pendulum has swung, mm -hmm. I think whenever you look at America, you'd find, you know, maybe, I don't know what, 40% of the people on one side, 40% of the other side, and 20% swinging back and forth. It, yeah, I, would you call it, say that 20% swinging back and forth of the independents? Because the yes. independents have been growing yeah. By, yeah. by great numbers. Yeah. And does that tell you then that if the independents are growing by great numbers that they n neither agree with one side or the other and they're thinking in some other way? Well, or um, they don't like what exists currently on either party you know, side. I, I, I don't like to stereotype people, yes. so I'm, I'm not going to jump into that. I, I wouldn't even stereotype your typical Democrat and your typical Republican. Right. And I, I certainly wouldn't do that with independents. I wouldn't say, well, these 20% or these 30% can be stereotyped like this and that. I mean, when I listen to people who call themselves Democrats, Republicans, or independents, mm. mm. they're so different, Susan. I just. Oh, there's you know, no question. I, I polarizing just, is, is most outside. Well, no, it's so days. different in, in a group. Yes. Oh, you're saying diversity within the two within groups. The, within the group. I don't like to say, yes. you know. No, I would agree. You know, I, I, agree. Grew up, I grew up with a Republican father and a Democratic mother, and we had some awfully good discussions <laughs> over the dinner, dinner table. table. I can remember exciting. the debates between yeah. them about Nixon and Kennedy. But that's all right. Mm. You know, they're mm. still married. Mm -hmm. uh, it works. Mm. You, you can do that. Mm. And uh, I, I think that's fine. Mm. But I don't say my father's a typical Republican or my mother's a typical Democrat. Sure. No, I mean, they are who they are. Well, you, you've written, obviously, a number of books. Um, and those books were a result of, were you asked to write them? Was it something, was it something that you felt needed to be put down on paper? How did they come about? Well, you know, you're, you're in broadcast journalism. Mm -hmm. And so you know how important the audience is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true in my job, too. And so it, it depends on the audience. Um, I've written a couple books where my audience is the law student. So I'm looking at somebody who's 23, 24 years old, who's going to be a lawyer, who may want to become an international lawyer or may not, but wants to learn international law from the ground mm -hmm. up. And that's one audience. I've also written for professional international mm -hmm. lawyers, people who are old people, 35 years old, 45 years old. You can only dream of it. Mm. And these people already know the trade. And they're good at it, mm -hmm. and they know a lot about it. And I'm writing to a specialized community 
in a specialized way. And that's different than writing to that student audience. And then the third audience I write for is the sort of the academic audience mm -hmm. that's interested in more the history of things, the doctrines of things, the policy of things. And that audience is different too, and I would write for them in a different way. If I had my druthers, I'd write like Dan Brown or Agatha Christie and yes. make a whole pile of money. But yes. I'm no good at that. I can't write fiction. Mm -hmm. I wish I could. Uh, I can't. But if I could, I would. But I can write to those three audiences, and mm -hmm. so that's to whom I write. And so it, it depends on, on who it is. I've always written uh, you know, to my own um, uh, measure, and I, I've always tried to, to write things that, to me, are worth writing. That's one of the nice things about being an academic, is that nobody really s says to you, yes. you've got to represent this client. You say, well, I don't know. Mm. You know, I'm not really, you say you, say you work for a liquor company. Mm. I'm not sure. You know, my parents don't drink. I don't think I'd want to represent mm. your company. I mean, your law firm is not going to listen yes. to that, right? Yes. People may have objections to alcoholic yes, that's inebriating correct. beverages, but as a lawyer, you're not really supposed to let that get in your way. If they're going to pay you to do a good job, you should go up and, and do that. But as, as an academic, I don't have to do that. I don't have to right. write about things or for people that I don't want to write for. Well, th then that brings me to another question. Obviously, when one, let's just talk about law in general. When one is talking about a personal inner feeling, and you said earlier in our conversation that you need to understand other people, you need to accept them for what they are, for what their particular constitution, what their country is, or how they operate within their country. Is it possible for lawyers, for the law, to put on that mask over the eyes and be totally open? Or do people still get influenced by their own inner judgment. Sure they get influenced. Mm. I mean we're all we're all, all, all human. So it, it it's a matter of degree, isn't it? I mean and, and a lot of the differences, you know, shouldn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't make a difference. Like you know, I sometimes ask my classes and I can ask you, you're holding a dinner party for mm -hmm. folks and you mm -hmm. want to impress. Mm -hmm. So when do you serve the cheese? Mm -hmm. Uh, normally fruit and cheese and an international thing would be at the end and some other parties you would be putting the fruit and cheese up front as an appetizer. That, you know, that's a, that's a great answer. You know, the, the tradition in America is that the cheese goes early on because it's easy to fix and people want to nibble. For the Italians nibble. it would be at the end. For the, Italian, the Italians at the end and for the French it would be mid-course. It would be right. after the, the meat dish be before the dessert. Which of those is right? Yeah, well, none of them, of course. Exactly right. right. But, you know, so you and, and if you want your people to feel at home and comfortable, mm -hmm. and you knew who your audience was, mm. that's how you would do it. Mm. And, and 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 a lot of things in international law and international transactions are like that, where there's not a moral element. Yes. It really doesn't. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but um, it really doesn't matter too much to me when you serve the cheese. Mm -hmm. I would rather people come to my house as invited guests that they feel welcome and comfortable, and I would like to serve the cheese when doing it. When Janet and I hold a dinner party, we think about that a little bit. Yes. We think about when we want to do it, and we will structure our dinner party a little bit differently depending on, mm. I know we had the last dinner party we had two weeks ago was for a group that had a very strong number of Germans mm -hmm. in it, and mm -hmm. we have a daughter-in-law who's German, and we know some about Germany, and so we tried to make it comfortable yes. for for people of the... Of well, you're cross-pollinating people. You're, you're introducing people to a new way of doing things, and you're yeah. making it acceptable that er everything is right. But with the law to me, the law to me is a little bit like numbers. Is it not very definitive? The difference that makes it is the interpretation of the law. Isn't that what separates it? I mean, it, I mean, it's all written down, A, and you've got the paragraph C, and so forth and so on. It's all very specific. But then when it really gets down to a court case, it's how it's interpreted. Well, I'm going to teach you some jurisprudence here. Mm -hmm. So um, the type of law you describe is like the rules of a sport. Mm -hmm. That's so uh, do you know anything about American football? A uh, fair amount. Okay. So if you score a touchdown, how many points do you get? Uh, six. Okay. How many players can you have on the field at one time? I think it's a 11. Exactly right. Okay. So what would happen if one of the teams says, we want to get nine points for a touchdown? and we want to play 15 players. Mm -hmm. Would the game can't work? Can't do it. Can't no. do it. So the rules you're describing are those kinds of rules. But even though you need concurrence between, say, the, the Packers and the Bears right. about the way you play the game, when the Packers face off against the Bears, you don't know who's going to win the game. Right. And so there's a lot of the game still to be determined. So 
law is not only a set of formal rules, but it's also a process of reaching judgment. Mm -hmm. Once the game's decided and the Packers beat the Bears 17 to 13, that's done. That's in the Hartford Current, goes in the sure. record books, it's done. But before it's done, all you can do is say certain things about it. You and I could say, well, we haven't watched this game yet, but Susan, I'm going to bet you each player's going to, each team's going to have 11 players on the field, and they're going to give three points for a field goal, and things in 100 yards long. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what goes within law is rules, as you say, mm -hmm. but then there's a lot of play in between. And I know you want to talk about the Constitution. One of the theories of the Constitution, this goes back to the Greeks, it doesn't yes. just go back to the English, it goes back to the Greeks, is that with a separated form of government like ours or the English or many other countries nowadays, you get combatants on the field. You get a certain tension. And this can be bad mm -hmm. and it can be good. But a couple of the ways in which it's good is, one, it's supposed to protect the people's liberty because if the people seeking power, whether or not they're in the executive branch or the legislative branch, judicial branch, and let's face it, all those people mm -hmm. are, may well be probably are power hungry. By them conflicting, there's a little bit of liberty left over for us in the, in the niches. And the other part of it is by the conflict of ideas and people representing those ideas, better results can come out, whether they're truer results or more economically efficient results, what have you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as some people have said about the American constitutional system, the founding fathers wanted a system where you had divided government and government didn't work, and they succeeded hugely. <laughs> and so we're not supposed to reach efficient results. We're not supposed to have agreement among all the different branches. We divide power not only between the president and the Congress and the courts, but between the House and the Senate, between the federal government and the states, between Massachusetts and Connecticut. We divide power all across. And that's one of the biggest differences in American governance. When I talk to, I mean, let's talk a little bit about Granby, which I don't know anything mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Who decides what textbooks you use in the Granby schools? Uh, I think actually that is somewhat a precedent of what is set in the state of Connecticut to some degree. Uh, and then locally, I would imagine there is some input. But I think it's set by the state of Connecticut. Very good. And so how much impact does the choice of, say, the Dallas Board of Education have on the good citizens of Granby School? Probably none. Do you even look at it? No. Could you care less? What about Dallas, thinking about the good citizens of Granby? Not at all. Do you think we'd have problems in the United States if we were organized like England and France, where your curriculum and school books were chosen in the Beltway in Washington? Well, to some, some degree, the uh, Common Core was exactly. trying to set that precedent. And we've had a lot of problems with that, haven't we? Mm -hmm. So one of the geniuses of American government is this localism. I mean, we're 350 million people. Population-wise, we're the third biggest country in the world. We're spread over a vast continent. I think geographically, we're the third biggest country geographically. We have people who come from all over the world who have very different views about politics, economics, religions, and the sum. And what goes on in our different states is hugely different depending on who's there. The people from Vermont don't act like the people from Alabama. Sure. The people from Utah don't act like the people from Maryland. And to me, that's sort of the hidden genius of the Constitution. I say hidden because it's not in the Constitution. I mean, I think the greatest contribution I think the founders made wasn't necessarily the separation of powers because to me, as I'm saying, that's right. totally predictable and old hat. Yeah. But to me, it was the idea of creating separate states. Connecticut gave up Ohio, as mm -hmm. you know. That used to mm -hmm. be ours. Virginia gave up uh, Kentucky. North Carolina gave up Tennessee. This idea of creating new states and not having the old states extend, going from 13 states to 50, I think that's permitted us to stay together with only one civil war. Well, I hate to cut you off, but we've used up our half hour and we could talk, we could talk forever. Uh, I have to say that if I'd had the opportunity, I wish I'd gotten my law degree earlier in my life. But I suppose one can always do what they really want to do. We'd love to have you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very thank you, much Susan. for your time, Mark. And uh, I'd like to remind you that you can see us on Facebook and you can see all of our programs on our website at www.ctvalleyviews.com. This is Susan Regan thanking you for joining me in bringing proof to the people.
Our thanks to Windsor Federal Savings for making this program possible. Neighbors helping neighbors since 1936. The CT Web Element is a groundbreaking collaboration in grassroots communication brought to you, the informed public, by the only independent producers of both a Connecticut public access TV show series and an online publication. Our objective is to provide public at large specific news, educational, and incisive coverage of local and national issues via interviews with Connecticut Valley View's guests and an aggregate of published commentary on issues important to our state's citizens. What topics will you find on CT Web Element? Eagle Eye, a compendium coverage on political, business, and economic views. Neighborhood Watch, a reference guide to registered criminals moving into your area. Scam Watches, registered sex offenders. Act Two, news of interest with links to opportunities and information for optimum life quality for those 50 and over. Healthcare Industry, key advisements concerning wellness, insurance, Medicare, long-term care, and medical facilities. Culture and Lifestyle, which includes trends, the arts, cuisine, decor, book and movie reviews. See it at www.ctvveb.com.